Well, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, as we continue our study in this very striking book. This book of 1 Corinthians is unlike any other book in the New Testament. Uh, it is not so much doctrinal as it is designed to take care of problems in the local church, specifically the church in Corinth. And as the Lord makes application to us, we know that it is relevant for us as well. Uh, this book poses many challenges. Uh, as I let other pastors around the country know which book I'm preaching, they inevitably raise their eyebrow and give some comment regarding the challenge of interpreting this book. And the passage that we have before us will require some skill of handling this and some uh, attention on your part as well to track with me. I want to begin by reading uh, the passage that we will look at today, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. The title of the message is, The Body is the Lord's. Beginning in verse 12, Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I trust that by reading this larger section, you see the theme of immorality and impurity and prostitution and defiling one's body is the theme that runs through this section and the call for moral purity. We live in a culture that is becoming increasingly sex-crazed every day. Sad to say, the recent sex scandals by our elected officials are but the tip of the iceberg of what lies hidden beneath the surface of our entire society. The most recent scandal has involved a sitting U.S. congressman from the state of New York, Representative Anthony Weiner. This once promising seven-term politician who was touted to be the next uh, mayor of the city of New York has recently resigned over his lewd online behavior only 11 months after being married. After sending obscene and vulgar photographs of himself to women, not his wife. In fact, women he has never even met. Weiner then lied to the press in an attempt to cover up his perversions. He claimed that his Twitter account had been hacked into and then began to pass blame on to others. For 10 days, Representative Weiner blatantly denied and lied in order to dodge the scandal. And the more he tried to cover it up with his lies, the worse it became, 
And what happened is he tried to send pictures of himself to women who were just asking questions about politics, and he hit the wrong button, and rather than sending it to a 21-year-old woman, he accidentally posted it for everyone to read. And once discovered that he had lied, not because he had posted this, but simply because he had lied about it, he was forced to resign. This is but the tip of the iceberg of our entire culture and society. This is but one more act of perversion by sleazy politicians. And there has been recently the discovery that California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger fathered a child with his long-term, a long-term member of his household staff and she was pregnant at the same time that his wife was preg pregnant, and they both gave birth at the same time, his own wife not knowing that he had fathered this child in the governor's mansion. How, how wicked, how vile, how raunchy, how lewd, how perverted can it be? New York Governor Elliot Spitzer resigned being governor of New York after being caught in the disgrace of using an, a call girl service which linked him with a prostitution ring. He now has his own cable news program. North Carolina senator and one-time presidential candidate John Edwards fathered a child with a campaign worker and apparently use campaign funds to, to cover it up. And so it goes. South Carolina Governor Mark Samford resigned after it was discovered he was having an affair with an Argentine mistress in Argentina. Others include New York Representative Chris Lee, Florida Representative Mark Foley, Louisiana Senator David Vitter, Indiana Senator Larry Craig, New York Governor James McGreevy, to say nothing of President Bill Clinton. And on and on and on it goes. This is only what lies on the surface for public view. We live in a culture and in a society that would be likened to a backed-up cesspool of iniquity as there is now flooding through our decadent society, all kinds of moral, sexual escapades. This is a little different from the wicked culture in which the Corinthians lived. The city of Corinth was known far and wide for its sexual immorality. In fact, the city of Corinth had become a verb, and if one was immoral and lewd, it was said that you were Corinthianizing. That's how identified they were with immorality. And the, most, the most prominent building in Corinth stood some 2,000 feet on top of a hill that overlooked the entire city of Corinth. It was the temple of Aphrodite, which is the Greek goddess of love. Uh, inside the temple of Aphrodite were some 1,000 religious prostitutes who lived there and, and worked there. And in the evenings, they came spilling out of the temple and came down into the city and offered their services to male citizens and to businessmen who were passing through the area and, to be sure, went out of their way to come to Corinth. The temple and the city of Corinth were known far and wide for its sexual orgies that knew no boundaries. This moral depravity spewed out into the cities and neighborhoods of this growing city. Sexual perversions were rampant. It was in just such an environment that God planted this church. God does not have to have the circumstances just right to plant a church. It doesn't have to be the right zip code and the right homogeneous unit and the right feel to the music 
and the right this or that, the right age of the preacher matching up with the right this or that, in the most impossible of situations, God, by the power of His truth and God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, planted this church in Corinth. But the fact is, this church continued to live with this ungodly environment and atmosphere and influence all around them, and it was continually hounding them and pressing after them to the point that some of the Corinthians weakened and were giving way to their old lifestyle and were trying to justify their lack of moral purity. It is because of this that Paul writes these verses. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ must be holy and pure. And God has set His standard for moral holiness. And God will never lower this standard. It is what it is, and it is God's own perfect holiness as recorded in His moral law and in the more excuse me, the moral imperatives of His Word. We need His grace and we need His mercy to enable us to reach this high standard. But we must understand, in every generation and in every place, God has said, flee immorality. I want us to walk through these verses, and they're, they're a little troublesome to understand. I've never actually taught through these verses and been forced to, to dig into them. I've quoted these verses many times. I, I've used them as cross-references, but I've never had to peel these, these verses apart layer by layer and phrase by phrase. And as I have dug into this, there is, there is a certain... I don't want to say complexity, but difficulty in understanding what is going on here. In other words, there's more than what meets the eye. So I want you to hang with me and, and follow as we go through these verses. I want to first group together verses 12 to 14. And I want to set on it the heading, Paul's Correction. Because that's what Paul is doing in verses 12 through 14. He is correcting the immorality that was allowed to fester in the church at Corinth. Now, I need to tell you something on the front end before we begin to work our way through these verses. What is going on here is a back and forth between you say, but I say unto you. For example, in verse 12, all things are lawful for me. I do not believe that that is what Paul is saying. Because all things are not lawful. This is what the Corinthians were saying. And then Paul's response, but not all things are profitable. Then he repeats it, all things are lawful for me. That is not what Paul is teaching. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say all things are lawful. Paul is repeating what the Greek philosophers were putting into the minds and coming out of the mouths of the Corinthians. The Corinthians were parroting, all things are lawful for me. Uh, the same is true at the beginning of verse 13. Food is for the stomach and stomach is for the... Is, is, for food, that too is a, a Corinthianized slogan or saying. And then, but God will do away with both of them, that too is Paul simply stating what they are saying, and what follows is Paul's correction. Uh, just to give you a precedence for this, this is exactly what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, verse 21, you have heard that the ancients were told, but verse 22, but I say unto you. Um, 
verse 27 of Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, verse 28, but I say unto you, this back and forth, the difficulty is, Paul does not say, you say. Now, as interpreters of the Bible, we're forced to make a decision here. Either Paul has given us an erroneous statement, all things are lawful, or Paul has given us an incomplete statement that we must supply some qualifiers to this, or Paul is simply quoting what they are saying that is allowing them to be very complacent in their immorality. The majority of the commentators support the last position, that what Paul is saying is what they are saying. Uh, Bruce Thistleton, an excellent commentator on the book of 1 Corinthians, writes this. The Greek used in the first century did not employ quotation marks. And the convention used in modern printed Greek texts of introducing direct speech by means of a capital letter postdates the period when all Greek letters were capitals or unicles. So the reader has to judge whether a phrase or a sentence is in a quotation, close quote. So this is our interpretive call as we rightly divide the word of truth, as we wrestle with what does God mean by what he says. So it is my understanding that verse 12 begins with Paul quoting their, their words. All things are lawful for me. It's quoted twice in verse 12, and it's also quoted twice in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. We're not certain the origin or the source of this. Perhaps a Greek philosopher. Uh, perhaps even one of the Gnostics. But the Corinthians had latched onto this phrase, all things are lawful for me, and they were using it as a license for what the rest of the paragraph develops, which is immorality and sexual impurity. They were using this carte blanche as license to sin. This was the basic underlying philosophy of the Greek philosophers. They were dualistic. And by dualism, we mean this, that they made a separation between the material and the immaterial, between the physical and the spiritual. And the Greek mindset behind Greek philosophy is that all that matters is the soul, but not the body. All that matters is the immaterial part of a man, not the material part of man. And this is probably why the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is all addressing the necessity of the resurrection of the physical body of Jesus Christ. This had so flooded into the church at Corinth that they had come to the place that they even equivocated on the resurrection of Christ from the dead because they saw that the body was of no value to God. They brought their Greek dualistic, Hellenistic philosophy and merged it with their Christian doctrine and in the process of that compromised and forfeited many sound words of truth. And so the Corinthians, in buying into Greek philosophy, were saying, all things are lawful for me. And this was the attitude behind it. And we hear it today. We're under grace. God forgives. And the implication, many times, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. God forgives. He's already forgiven. You're in. Or, there is no law in the life of the Christian today. There is no moral directive 
for our life. We have freedom in Christ. We have liberty in Christ to live however we want to live. We just let the Spirit lead us. We can do whatever we please. We have no restrictions. We have full freedom in Christ. We are free to do whatever we want to do. We are no longer slaves of sin. We are no longer slaves of Satan. We're all free. That is what Paul is attacking. That kind of, uh, of libertine mindset and that kind of antinomian mindset that would suppose that all things are lawful for me. Well, let me tell you, all things are not lawful for us. There are countless imperatives in the New Testament that say, thou shalt not. And by examples given in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, there are many prohibitions given to us. So this is not true. All things are lawful to us. But notice how Paul responds. But not all things are profitable. That is Paul's way of saying, but I say unto you, not all things are profitable. This is Paul's counterplay. He argues that those things that are unlawful are unprofitable for our spiritual lives. God is so good that he tell, all that He tells us to do is profitable for our spiritual lives. And everything that God tells us do not do, that too is profitable for our spiritual lives. God has not made an arbitrary decision and drawn a line whimsically that He has said certain things we cannot do and some things we cannot do, uh, other things we cannot do, as if there are some profitable things that God is withholding from us. Everything that God has called us to do and everything that we are not to do, whether in the positive or in the negative, that is all profitable to us. I've told you before, just like when a parent says to a child, do not put your hand upon the hot skillet, that is a very profitable thing for the child not to do that. When the parent says, do not put your finger in an electrical socket, that is a very profitable thing for that child not to do that. God is not withholding simply to be negative. God is intensely positive in all that He leads us to do. That is what Paul is saying here. But I say to you, not all things are profitable. Everything that God withholds from us or steers us away from, those things are unprofitable for us and not permitted. In the middle of verse 12, Paul repeats again this same uh, Corinthian slogan, this same Corinthian maxim drawn from the wells of the Greek philosophers, all things are lawful for me. In other words, I have the right to do whatever I want, everything I want, and God forgives it. Well, let me be quick to say yet again, this is definitely not the teaching of the Apostle Paul. It is not the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the teaching of the prophets. All things are not lawful. Paul now counters at the end of verse 12, but, as if to say, but I say to you, I will not be mastered by anything. All sin has an enslaving power to it. And all sin forges chains around us. That is why he says, If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And so Paul says, I cannot pursue those things that are sinful because that, they w that sin would begin to gain mastery over me. Now, look at verse 13. Verse 13 is another Corinthianized statement that has no basis in truth. 
food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for truth, but God will do away with both of them. Well, God will not do away with both of them. The Corinthians are here downplaying the place of the body even in the afterlife, that we will just be disembodied spirits in heaven with, with no body. And so therefore, they were backing into this and concluding, wrongly so, that it does not matter what I do in my body because the Lord will do away with my body and my stomach and food in the world to come. Well, that is not true. Jesus was raised from the dead. He is in a glorified body. You and I will be raised from the dead. This corruptible will put on incorruptible. This perishable will put on imperishable. And we will live throughout all of the ages to come in a glorified body. When Jesus redeemed us, He redeemed every inch and every ounce of us including our bodies. And so, this entire statement is based upon, predicated upon, a, again, a, a, a worldview that is dualistic and makes a division between the spiritual and the physical, between the temporal and the eternal, between the visible and the invisible, Now, when he says food is for the body and body is for the food, they were using that as a basis for being able to say, well, sex is for the body and body is for sex, and therefore there should not be moral restraints. And also, and he says in verse 13, if you're still hanging with me, When he says food is for the body, excuse me, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, in chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 4, he will talk about meat offered to idols. Back in this temple of Aphrodite, there were the prostitutes, there was the immorality and the impurity of so-called worshipers who sought to reach a euphoric high through some sexual climactic experience, and in that same temple, there was food offered to idols. And the mention of food here in verse 13 probably is to be coupled together in our thinking with this, the immorality that was taking place in the temple, and there with meat offered to idols and spewing out into the city of Corinth and and rubbing shoulders with the believers, and with some of the believers in Corinth, they were succumbing to this temptation, and they were forfeiting their moral purity, and believing, well, I am forgiven, and it really has no lasting effect upon my life. So Paul counters at the end of verse 13, And he says, yet the body is not for immorality. That is to counter what he has just said in verse 13. Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. And Paul slam dunks those statements and says, but I say to you, the body is not for immorality. That's the exchange that is going on here. God has set definite moral limits to what the body can do and what the body cannot do. Admittedly, there are some, er- some gray areas, but not in the area of sex. It is restricted for a husband and wife within the sacred bonds of marriage only. And any sex outside of marriage between a man and and a woman is unlawful, and it is unprofitable. That is what Paul is correcting. And then at the end of verse 13, Paul creates his own uh, axiom, his own maxim, 
his own truth statement, and it mirrors the one from the world where they were saying, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. Paul goes, well, I've got one for you. Here it is. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. How about that one? That is what Paul is doing here. He is responding to their statement with his own statement. So, the word but at the end of verse 13, but, it is as if Paul is saying, but I say unto you. Total, totally antithetical to what they were saying, 180 degrees in the other direction, Paul is saying, no, this is the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. You can supply, it is implied to be supplied that the body should go after the word but. I've written it in my notes in brackets, which is the way you would put it into a written document. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body, specifically in the area of sexual activity. In other words, whatever is done in our body must be done only, we must do only that which is lawful before the Lord, which will glorify the Lord, which will magnify the Lord, which is within the boundaries of what the Lord sanctions, and that and that alone is profitable. Now, verse 14 in context, makes a lot of sense. Out of context, it seems like an odd addition. Look at verse 14. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through His power. Why would Paul suddenly now talk about the resurrection? Well, he'll devote an entire chapter to the resurrection, in, in chapter 15, he'll eventually work his way to this very thought. But what Paul is underscoring here is that the human body and what is done in the human body is so critically important to the eternal plan and purpose of God that even after we die, God will, at the end of the age, raise our body from the dead and put our soul and our spirit back into our body, and we will live forever in a resurrected, glorified body. That's how important our body is. And what Paul is countering is the ungodly wisdom of the world that was saying it doesn't matter what you do in your body. And then the Corinthians just took hyper-grace and salted it on that statement and said, hey, we can do whatever we want to do in our body. We have liberty in Christ. We have freedom in Christ. And we'll never even see our body again after we die. And Paul says this in verse 14, to build a dam in that flowing river, that it will not flow anymore. No, God will raise up our bodies, and this is intended to counter what he says in the middle of verse 13. In the middle of verse 13, but God will do away with both of them, but at the end of verse 13, or in verse 14, Paul denies that. So, either we have Paul contradicting himself, or Paul is quoting what the Corinthians are saying and showing what God says. Here's the point. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter what society says. All that matters is what does God say regarding the government of our lives, how we should order our steps. We cannot be squeezed into the mold of this world. We cannot adopt the mindset of this world, what J. Vernon McGee called stinking thinking. 
we must preserve virginity and purity and morality and godliness in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now may God the Holy Spirit give you illumination and give you insight into the true meaning of these verses that we have just considered. Because it requires some careful attention to understand what Paul is actually saying in these verses. Now second, I want to group verses 15 and 17 together. And I want to move now, secondly, from Paul's correction to Paul's challenge. Paul has corrected their erroneous, dualistic worldview. And he has said, there is no dualism. Your body does matter to God. What you do in your body matters to God. Every inch, every ounce from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, it is all under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now Paul's challenge. Beginning in verse 15, and Paul now begins by asking a, a series of questions. The first question, verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? He's reasoning with them. He's wanting them to think. Do you not know? And that statement is repeated some six times in this chapter alone. Do you not know? It's unique to 1 Corinthians 6. And the question demands an affirmative answer. Paul reminds the Christians that I know that you know this. And if you do not know this, it is only because you have forgotten what you know. Do you not know? This is common knowledge. If you are in Christ and if you are breathing, you know this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Paul is saying here that our physical body is united to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ lives in us. We are one with Christ. And what we do in our bodies is of enormous importance because Christ is not distant upon a throne only. He is also indwelling us, and He is one with us, and He is attached to us, and it is because of this union that we have with Christ in our body that demands that we be careful what we do in our bodies. Because our bodies are members of Christ. Our bodies are not disconnected from Christ. And where Paul is headed with this is if you go back up to that temple and if you join yourself to a prostitute, you are attaching Jesus Christ to that prostitute. That is where Paul's argument is going. Every sin that we commit, but he has in his crosshairs the sin of sexual immorality, but every sin involves Christ not as the author of that sin, but we bring him into that sin, especially the sin of sexual impurity and sexual immorality. That ought to put a stop sign in front of every one of us here today. Whatever the sin, whatever we set before our eyes, Whatever we lay hold of with our hands, whatever we are involved with in our body, Jesus Christ is a, a part of this. Then he asks another question. Shall I then take away 
the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute. Now, if my body parts are now members of Christ, his argument is, can I now take my body parts that have become united to Christ, can I attach them to the members of a prostitute? It's unthinkable. That's why he says right after that, may it never be. It's the strongest, most emphatic negative in the entire Greek language. It means never, 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 never. No way ever. It is the ultimate repudiation. It is the negative in the strongest terms that linguistic, linguistics allow in the Greek language. We may never attach our members that have been attached to Christ unlawfully to someone who is not our wife. Paul says, may it never be. God forbid. It's to be repudiated immediately. He then asks another question in verse 16. And, and Paul is challenging them with this series of questions that are in staccato fashion. Boom, 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 boom. Verse 16, or do you not know? Again, Paul is saying, I know you know this. You're acting as if you don't, but intellectually you do know this. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, God says, quoting now Genesis 2, verse 22, 24, the two shall become one flesh. This is an astounding statement. Paul says that there is a deep relationship between two people through their sexual Union. They become one flesh. Whether they're husband and wife, there is a union. There is, there is something that happens. The assumption by many is, is, or the assumption is by this, that every sexual act between a man and a woman fuses them into one flesh. So in other words, you better only be fused to your wife. And therefore, there is no such thing as casual sex that has no lasting, enduring consequences. Even when the partners have no intentions of forming a mutual commitment. If a Christian joins himself to a prostitute or someone who is not his wife, this immoral act has aligned the Christian against God. And to underscore the tightness of this bond, he says in verse 17, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. One would say, would to God that would not be so if one is unlawfully joined to someone who is not his wife, this only binds the seriousness of any unlawful sexual activity by a Christian because that Christian is one spirit with Christ. And Christ is now brought into the den of iniquity. So note third, Paul's command. Two words. Beginning of verse 18. This is no time for an essay answer. This is no time to sit down and to pontificate and to philosophize and to give a long extended answer. Paul has two words. Flee immorality. Flee immorality. 
Do not coddle it. Do not pamper it. Do not rationalize it. Do not excuse it. Do not justify it. Do not minimize it. Run from it. Shun it. Stay away from it. Flee from it. Proverbs 5 says, Can a man take a fire into his bosom and be not burned? The answer is no. You are headed for a furnace and there will be a fire that will be ignited within your soul that will singe and will torch and will scorch and will burn you. Flee from it. Yes, God will forgive you, but there will be the scar in the mind, and it will be there, and there will be the forfeiture of joy and peace. Read Psalm 51. Read Psalm 32. And the forfeiture of the power of God, and even qualification for ministry. The word flee is in the present tense. Every moment of every day, you and I are to flee immorality. We are to be always fleeing immorality. Before you are married, while you are married, it is in the imperative mood, flee. It is a command from God. We are to be like Joseph with Potiphar's wife, when she made advances to him, it was no time to sit down and to have a talk about this. It was a time for Joseph to run out of the room, and he left so quickly, he left her with his clothing in her, her hand as she had tried to lay hold of him. Ephesians 5 verse 3 says, But immorality or any impurity, or greed, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Colossians 3, verse 5, Consider the members of your body as dead to immorality. Now, when we turn on television, this is not the message that comes through the screen. When you turn on your computer, this is not, these are not the signals that are coming through. But God's counsel to save your soul is you need to flee, you need to run, and this includes even what you set before your eyes. Now, finally, Paul's clarification. In the middle of verse 18, Paul now wants to correct a third slogan, a third um, worldview statement, a, a third life statement that was floating around the church in Corinth that had come in from the temple on the hill and was being brought in by other people. And here it is. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. Well, that's just not true. Uh, gluttony is a sin. Uh, that's committed against the body. Uh, th there are other sins that one commits against the body. Uh, I illicit drug use is, is a sin against the body. Uh, being drunk is a sin against the body. Now, this arises, again, out of the, the Greek philosophers and the Greek way of looking at life and making this distinction between the body and the soul and or the spirit. And they are saying every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But Paul counters to the contrary, but, and now here is the truth, the immoral man sins against his own body. They are trying to lessen it by, by saying, 
Well, it's okay to commit sins against your body because your body doesn't matter to God. Uh, this body is not reality. All that is reality is your soul and your spirit and your mind. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. And Paul says at the end of verse 18, yes, it does matter. The immoral man sins against his own body. That is in total contradistinction from the first or the middle of verse 18, what they were saying. Paul issues this straightforward denial of what they are saying. The immoral man sins against his own body. It invites venereal disease. It invites dishonor. It destroys not only his body, it destroys his soul as well. And then he continues to clarify in verses 19 and 20. After the command, flee immorality, he's now clarifying, and he is now giving somewhat of, a, of an essay answer, although in very succinct form, on why it is that our body matters to God and what we do in our body. He says in verse 19, it matters because the Holy Spirit of God lives in our body, and our body has become the temple of His holy presence. So look at verse 19, or do you not know? Paul sounds like a broken record at this point. Almost every verse begins, or do you not know? He's almost having to treat them like children, and in fact they are because they are babes in Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. They, they should have grown up long ago, but they still are in this infantile stage uh, of, of stunted growth. In other words, they are spiritual pygmies at this point. And that's why Paul has to keep talking to them as though they, they are cubbies in Awana. Do you not know? Surely you know this. I know that you know this. You have to know this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? This is intended to play off of the temple of Aphrodite on top of the Acropolis, uh, 2,000 feet. Many of them were saved out of that sewer of iniquity, and some of them are now tempted to want to rub shoulders with that again. And so Paul continues this temple imagery really to, to shock them, to closely connect the dots. That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. The imagery is simple. It is straightforward. Paul strongly affirms that they must maintain moral purity as a believer in Jesus Christ because not only are they attaching Christ to this prostitute, they are also dragging the Holy Spirit of God into this indecent act and making the second and the third member of the Godhead participants in this. I don't know that there's anything stronger that can be said. You're one with Christ. You become one with a prostitute. You're attaching Christ to this prostitute. And now he says, you are attaching the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you to the prostitute when you attach yourself to her. You need to flee and get away from her and away from that as far as you possibly can. If you need a new way to walk to work, find it. Stay away. If you need a new job, then get it. Stay away. If you need to throw your computer away, throw it away. You lived without it before, you can live without it now. And then he says in verse 20, Four, and that means he's continuing this, this explanation. Here's one more reason why. For 
You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. He brings them back to the cross. He brings them back to the glory of, of the cross. That upon that cross, all of their sin was transferred to the sinless Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sin in His body. And upon that cross, as He was lifted up to die in our place, the Father absolutely crushed His Son as He came under the full weight of the wrath of God upon that cross, as He suffered and bled and died for our sins. And with that sin-bearing, wrath-absorbing death, Jesus bought us. And we're not our own. We belong to King Jesus. Not only by right of creatorship, but by right of redemption. And we must now glorify God in our bodies. And we have no right whatsoever to live however we want to live and do whatever we want to do with our bodies. Christ, upon that cross, earned the right to direct every step of our lives from now throughout eternity. We are not free to, do, to go our own way, to make our own calls, to establish our own set of rules, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Christ owns us. We are no longer, we no longer belong to sin. And we certainly do not belong to ourselves. We belong to Christ. And therefore, we must glorify God. For those of you here today who are in any way courting any kind of sexual sin in your life, I hope that this message rises up and sounds an alarm in your conscience that as of five minutes ago, it's over that you have repented, that you are repenting, that you confess your sin before God, that you alter the direction of your life dramatically and radically by the power of the Holy Spirit and motivated by the grace of God. You must flee immorality. You must get out of that relationship. You must turn off that program. You must stop flirting with that woman. You must get out of it. And to whatever extent this message is intersecting with your life, I plead for you. I plead for what is best for your life. That you will pursue holiness. That you will pursue godliness. And you will not be like an animal in heat headed for the slaughter. But you will repent and come to the gracious, loving, purifying arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Come, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as snow. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
you would come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you would plunge yourself into a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and you would be washed, and you would be cleansed, and you would be restored by the mercy of God. If you have never believed upon Jesus Christ, there is no forgiveness. There is no cleansing. There is no washing. There is only guilt and stain and condemnation. And you are storing up wrath until the day of wrath. Would you not come to Christ today, this very moment, and throw yourself upon his mercy? He says, Him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Why would you cling to your sin any longer and procrastinate and wait in coming to Christ. If you wait to come to Christ, you will only have more sin to confess. Your heart will only be that much harder. Your soul will only be that much more guilt-stricken. Why would you not come to Christ this very day, this very moment? He's calling to you to come to Him. He says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. He says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. The Lord Jesus Christ invites you to come to himself today, this moment, this hour, and he will receive you and He will forgive you, and He will wash you, and He will restore you, and He will give you a new heart, and He will give you a new start and a new beginning in life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. You'll give up dirt for diamonds if you come to Christ. You'll give up your sin for salvation. You'll give up your guilt for grace. You'll give up your wretchedness for repentance. There's never been a greater offer extended to you, and there will never be an offer greater than this. Come to Christ, believe upon Him, and He will forgive you, and He will give you a new life. Let us pray. Father, or as I begin to pray, we will not sing the last closing him, but I would like for the instruments to play as we take the offering. And men, would you prepare yourself to stand and to take the offering? Father, for those who have come under the grip of sexual sin, I pray that you would show mercy and show grace, bestow compassion. Set the prisoners free. And may these words from the Apostle Paul fulfill their purpose in broken hearts and in broken lives this day. Father, as we now take this offering, we offer thanks for the faithfulness that you have worked into your people. And may they continue to be a means of supplying what is needed for the spread of the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.